Let's fill up the choir. Please come help us if you would. to see this good number here. I believe we can make a joyful noise tonight. Would you stand, please? Get a favorite hymns of praise number 164. I serve a risen Savior. Amen. He lives.
prayer, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you again, God, for letting us be in the house of God. Lord, it is wonderful yes. to be here. I pray, God, you please bless all that's done tonight. Yes. Lord, may the singing be uh, wonderful and from the heart. And Lord, yes. may the preaching be powerful. God, may the Holy Ghost of God come down upon yes. the preaching tonight. Yes. And Lord, may there be unction, God. Yes. May there be conviction yes. of the house of God. And Lord, may you revive our hearts yes. and our souls. God, we pray. Yes. And we'll ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Thank you. Can you imagine up in heaven the joy there is that day? As a sinner bows his head to pray, can't you hear the Father say? Thankful to be born again tonight. I bless his 
Isn't that good? Bam. That'll help you. Stand redeemed in the blood of the Lamb. They talked about the value of one. I remember we were praying for Hunter to get saved. And uh, I don't mean to embarrass him, but I mean, I can't believe a boy like that get embarrassed having me as a dad. I mean, but, uh, you know, it's just, I feel like I complained enough about it. I ought to give God as much glory as I complained about it. Don't you think? But I remember he's at Brother Bearden's house. He's working for Brother Bearden. And Brother Bearden said, I'm going to give you a little something. Hunter made this statement. He may not even remember it. But he said, oh, don't give me nothing. I ain't worth nothing. Brother Bearden was telling me this story. Brother Bearden said, I stopped him. And I said, young man, he said, I don't ever want to hear you say that again. I think Brother Bearden knows the value of a soul. Remember, I gave you that quote not long ago that our love must be measured by, well, in the market anyway, the price of a, the value of a thing is measured by what a man's willing to give for it. And so your value is subjective. To me, you may not be worth a whole lot. I may not be worth a lot to you. But to God, Amen. evidently you're worth losing, it, losing his life for. Amen. Sounds like you're worth quite a bit tonight. I don't think you ain't worth nothing. Well, I understand that feeling too. Because in the eyes of God, we got nothing to offer. We are nothing. We do like Brother Sammy, stick our hand in a five-gallon bucket and pull it out. You know, that, I understand that. But you, you're valuable to God. God loves you. He wants to save you. And he wants to keep you and preserve you blameless. Still is coming. So thank God for the good singing tonight. I want Brother Mason Gill and his young men to come. Would you come and uh, let them play a little bit? And, just, and I appreciate these young men being with him, him being willing to come. And um, I, tell, I thought they did a great job this morning. they been a blessing to my heart. So they're going to come. They're going to sing one or two for us. Whatever's on your heart, preacher, to do is be all right with me. I just want God to have his way tonight. I got no plan than to just not do anything that would grieve the Holy Ghost. That's my only plan tonight. So let's just let the Lord have his way tonight. And uh, I want to hear Brother Mullins preach as much as anybody. But I'd rather God show up either way. And uh, he'd do more than, than any of us could do. So you be praying. They're going to they're gonna, uh, get set up here and sing for us. Lord, we sure love you tonight. And Lord, I don't know if I could ever thank you enough for saving my children, giving me a wife that loves me. I, I wish every man on this planet could know what it's like to be loved like you've given me a wife that loves me. And so, Lord, these children, you've given us and entrusted us with their lives and souls. Help us to do right by them. Help us to love them. Help us to lead them. Guide them and direct them. And let them, Lord, please experience real revival in the presence of God in these miserably sinful last days. We love you. Help you, preacher, tonight. If it be your will, I don't know anything. Lord, calm my nerves. Give me wisdom well beyond my years to know what you want done. And Lord, either way, whatever's done, just get glory to yourself. Thank you for saving sinners. Thank you for loving us, Lord, in spite of what we are. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, the Lord's good to us, isn't he? Thank God for his goodness. I've preached a lot of things through the years on the, the grace of God, salvation. I guess later on in life, you know, you read verses and you know the contents and the context of them. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, they kind of come alive to you. And, uh, you know, I got to thinking about the goodness of God that leads a man to repentance. And I know there's probably a lot of different experiences that could be testified about here uh, in the church house tonight about maybe what was preached or you know I know people got saved because they realized that hell was a reality and the judgment of God and different things of that nature but at the end of the day the reality of the goodness of God is what brings a man to the act of repentance and turning toward the Lord amen and I'm thankful for the goodness of God that's what this song's about true to the Lord's been the Lord's been better to us all than we deserve but I thank God for his goodness amen
good friends to me are so precious. Your love is like I've never known. For you've been so gracious to me. You gave me a fine family. You proved you loved me on Calvary. For you've been so gracious to me. That's beyond understanding. Oh, and it comes from the Father above, and His riches could never be measured because of our Savior's great love. Now, some morning I'll wake up in the morning, and I'll see my dear loved ones again. for his goodness, amen, and for his grace. They sang this this morning. I'm going to let them sing it for you, amen, to see if we can get this mic a little bit closer. Amen. I think the whole key, amen, to all that we are and all that we do is to tell others about Jesus, amen, what that song in the choir was about. So we're going to let the boys sing this again. We had some other ones that we were going to sing, but I want them to sing this for you. Amen. Let me tell you about Jesus and of what he's done for me. How we saved a poor old sinner. Now my soul has been set free.
Amen. Thank you, young man, Brother Massingale. Appreciate you so much. Well, that's good, isn't it? Amen. 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 Well, uh, this, uh, Tyler, won't you all come on? Get your group ready to sing. I want to obey the Lord. You know, through the years, I've, I've, not, I've made little of music. I made a grave error in that. Music's very important to the worship of God. Amen. And uh, I wish I'd have learned better earlier about that. Uh, but it's very important. I know preaching is the main thing, uh, but the music's quite important to the worship of the Lord. And uh, so you young men, uh, do all you can as early as you can. It's important to God. God loves it. So you uh, pray for these young people. They're going to sing one, and we'll, I don't know, tell a story or read a poem or something like that. Get one of these men. You ready? All right. You pray for these young people and worship the Lord together. been looking back along this winding road to the old familiar markers of the mercies I have known. I know it may sound simple, but it's more than I can explain. There's no other way to tell you than to say, God's been good. cried some bitter tears oh but I felt his arms around me as I faced my greatest fears I've had more gains than losses and I've known more joy than hurt as his grace fell down upon me undeserved God's been good in my Tell you everything he is. But the best way I can say it is this God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so share of hard times by my side he's always stood through it all God's been good actually couldn't ever say God has been Good. Brother Blue would tell you he is good. He'd crack every time he said, right. Well, you know what I mean, brother. I'm not trying to. He wouldn't let you get by with it. God is good. He is good. We'll be good. Always is good. Amen. Well, uh, I'm going to put him on the spot. John, your family here with you? Can they sing for us tonight? I hate to put them on the spot, but they just need to be coming on because I sure would like to hear them tonight. I didn't plan on doing that, to be honest with you. I told John in the car I wasn't going to do that. That wasn't a lie, brother. I'm not a liar. i got to follow God. Amen. 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 
Amen. Boy, they, I appreciate these young people right here. They're good young people. Love the Lord. The Lord touches them when they sing. And, and uh, I sure am glad I'm saved tonight. I still marvel at it. I don't know why God saved me. I have no idea. I know why he did. We read the Bible because he's God. He's who he is. But I mean, he didn't, sure didn't get much, but I sure am glad he loved me. Aren't you tonight? God's been good in my life, given me so much. I never knew, never dreamed all God would do. You, you know, you, you want to be saved. God does exceedingly abundantly above. And I just wanted to be forgiven, you know, get right with God. He's done so much more. So we'll let these young people sing to us tonight. And um, then Brother Mullins, we're going to have you. We're going to have some preaching tonight. So you pray for these young people and worship together as they sing. Cam, come here, brother.
and to know the love of Christ with passeth knowledge. Amen. 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 The more you go along with him, the more you learn about him. Now, who wouldn't want to serve him? Amen. Well, I think we need to have some preaching. We need some preaching tonight. Where's Brother Mullins? Look right past you, preacher. I sure appreciate you coming, being with us, brother. Appreciate you very much. And uh, I want Brother Sexton, you care to pray uh, for us, pray for Brother Mullins as he comes to preach to us. And uh, God shows the foolishness of preaching to save them believe. So pray God will touch him if you would, Brother Sexton. We love you, preacher. And Brother Sexton, uh, Mullins, you come on, make your way up here and get ready to preach. And uh, let's humble ourselves under the preaching tonight, all right? Thank you, Brother Sexton. <clears throat> Thank the Lord for all the music tonight and everything that's been said. Much has been said about the goodness of God, and uh, we can never, in our limited vocabulary or our lack of understanding, appreciate how good God really is to us. He's so good. Brother Boyer was talking about never got over the wonder of how God saved us. Neither have I, and I don't ever want to. <clears throat> if you go back and remember where God brought you from. Amen. Some were in church. Some had families that were Christian people and raised in a right kind of atmosphere and all of that. But some of us didn't, and I was one of those that didn't. A very, very, very wicked family of people that I came out of. I'm talking about my mother's side and my dad's side. And uh, I'm still amazed at how the Lord ever found me. I, I mean that. I'm not just trying to sound good. I'm still amazed at how God ever found me and lifted me and brought me out of such a mess and saved me. And then here I stand tonight among God's people. I'm grateful. I've said this before, but <clears throat> first little church I pastored, I pastored before I even got married. The first church I pastored, I would hear some of those old saints. About every meeting or two, they'd stand and they'd say something like this. They would say, I just want to thank the Lord for His grace and His mercy, His goodness and His forgiveness. They'd say a few words like that and they'd sit down. The next meeting would come back together. Some of those same old saints would stand up. And they would say, I just want to thank the Lord for His grace and His mercy and His goodness and His forgiveness. They'd sit down. We'd come back the next meeting. Same crowd would stand up and say, I just want to thank the Lord. For his grace and his mercy and his goodness. Here I stand 46 years after God saved me. I don't have much to say, just I thank the Lord for his grace and his mercy and his goodness. There's not a soul in this building tonight that does not deserve to be in hell. Not one of us. 
And sometimes, Brother Mass and Gail, it do us good just to go back to that hole of the pit that God digged us out of and changed us. And I, I, just, I don't mean to go back in the sense of what Jesus said about looking back, not fit for the kingdom of God. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about just being reminded. Amen. I'll say this and I'll preach in a minute, but just being reminded that when God found us, Brother David, I wasn't in a nice suit. I didn't have hair cut up right. I didn't talk right, look right, and act right, spit right. But he loved me anyway. And I, I just want to thank him one more time publicly tonight for coming to a hippie, a long-haired hippie that had attempted suicide the year before I got saved. I was at the absolute bottom. If you can go any lower than I was, it's pretty bad. But he came to where I was. And he can do the same for you and your family that's in bad shape. He can do it for you. Thank you for letting us come tonight, Brother Boyer, Brother Jones, Brother Jones, Brother Bearden. Thank you for the preaching this morning. So wonderful, so good, so timely, so needed. And I appreciate it so very much. Let's all stand tonight. Seven or eight years ago, I was driving to a meeting in North Carolina. <clears throat> Barry Rackley called me and he said, I got a question for you. I said, well, what's the question? He said, I'm going to preach a two-day Bible conference. And he said, what do you preach for a two-day Bible conference? And I said, well, brother, all I know is just preach what God tells you to preach. Amen. I said, I don't care if it's called a Bible conference, a missions conference, a revival, a jubilee, or a preacher's fellowship. All I know to do is just try to find what the Lord wants to preach it. And he said, that's probably the best advice I've ever got. I'm going to use my own advice tonight. I have a burden for what I want to say. John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Would you pray God help us tonight? Thank all you young people for being here. John chapter 3. This is where the Lord just continues to put in my heart tonight. I was trying to think today, and I've got to move on. I was trying to think today, if I have, I can't remember it. I don't know in 46 years, this is awful. I don't know in 46 years if I have ever heard a man preach on the new birth. Just on the new birth. That's awful, isn't it? I want to preach tonight on being born again. Amen. John 3, 1. John 3, verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. 
Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and you receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Thank God for these verses of Scripture. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son. Oh, we ought to shout on this verse. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Our Father, tonight we bow before you in Jesus' name. Lord, with a thankful heart. Lord, even at my age, I sometimes stand and wonder why I'm here. Lord, with all these great men, great Christian people, and Lord, uh, have access to your Bible tonight. And Lord, access to your Holy Ghost. And Lord, I pray tonight, Lord, that the Spirit of God would take complete and full charge of my mind and my mouth, and yea, my motive. And God, speak to us tonight. Without doubt, Lord, in this congregation, someone sits here lost, needing you. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. I pray you do tonight. God, what only you can do. Speak to us, Lord. Speak to us. Speak to us. Lord, we pray. Help my heart, I pray, to say what you won't say. We love you. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. and amen. Thank you. You can be seated. We don't seem to hear much today about being born again. We hear the terminology, but very little preaching about it. Confusion abounds on this subject. Seems like the very thought of being born again is a word that is a relic and an antique in yesterday. But Jesus has put here in the Bible exactly how we are to get right with God. Amen. We must be born again. A lot of needs in a person's life physical needs, material needs, things of his life. But the greatest need of your life is to be born again. It's a spiritual need. Would you pray God help us tonight? All forms of religion aimed at anything less than biblical salvation is cultic in its nature. Let me repeat that statement. Everything it religiously that's aimed at anything less than biblical salvation is cultic in its nature. I believe that with all my heart. 
and it'll land the soul in hell one day without God. The greatest need of humanity is to be born again. Jesus didn't say you ought to be born again. He didn't say that you should be born again. He didn't say that you need to be born again. He didn't say that if you're born again, that if you get some religion, it'll help your life. He said that you must be born again. I'm just taking my time a minute. Webster said the meaning of that word must is means an imperative need of a duty, a requirement. It is a requirement. There's no other way. There's no other way into God's heaven except through the new birth. A requirement placed upon us by God himself that we cannot effectuate and bring to pass, produce in ourself. It's a work of God's spirit totally, absolutely, fully, holy, absolutely a work of the Spirit of God. There can be no natural life without a natural birth, and there can be no spiritual life without a spiritual birth. When Jesus spoke this to Nicodemus, the national life of Israel had reached a low. The religion was corrupt. If you look at chapter 2, he shows you that the religion was corrupt. He had to go in and cleanse the house of God. The temple was defiled and truth had been departed. There was no power whatsoever to bring to pass anything spiritual nature in the life of the people of Israel. The whole religion was corrupt. Not only were the religion was corrupt, the rulers was carnal. Amen. Chapter 3 stated that twice Nicodemus said, how can this be? And Jesus said, you call yourself a master of Israel and you don't know these things. Their, their rulers was corrupt. Their mind was corrupt. And there was no, no, real, no, no real truth in their mind. The religion was corrupt. The rulers were carnal, and the response was to condemn truth. All they know to do was to condemn the mouth of truth. Jesus makes three statements here. I'm going to be here a while. I I feel a real burden in my heart to get through this tonight. Jesus makes three statements, or three statements are made in this verse, rather, Three imperatives, three divine must, or three divine imperatives. He said, first of all, there is the Calvary experience, verse 14. For as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must. That's a divine imperative. That's a, that's a necessity. It's a duty. There's the Calvary experience. Then he mentions in verse number 3 through uh, 15, verse 7, you must be born again. That is the conversion experience. And then in verse 30, there is the conformity experience. He must increase, but I must decrease. So Jesus mentions three divine imperatives in this chapter, three things that must happen in the life of everybody that professes to know God. There must be the Calvary experience, Jesus being lifted up where he got crucified, the conversion experience where you get born again, and then the conformity experience where you you die and Christ comes alive in your life and you're conformed to the image of God's Son. Many, I've got to hurry here, but many are leaving this biblical term of you must be born again. I, I want to take my time tonight. I, I do not want to miss what God wants me to say. The concept of man today is totally different than what this Bible teaches. The Bible totally teaches that man is totally depraved. He cannot come to God on his own accord, and he will not come to God on his own accord. The Bible teaches that we're born in sin. We're born sinful before God. By that, we're bound to sin. We're chained to sin, and we cannot get ourselves out of sin. Would y'all pray for me tonight? We cannot 
not get herself out of sin. In every son of Adam, there is an invisible chain that's got him bound to sin, and he cannot break that chain. As years pass by, that chain does not get looser. It gets tighter and tighter and tighter. He is bound in sin, and he cannot free himself. He is literally, according to John chapter 8, he is a servant. He is a servant to sin. I remember before I got saved, I really got to wanting to be free from sin. I did. I won't tell you all the sin I was in. I was headed to jail or hell. I got to wanting to, I really got to wanting to get free. I tried for three years to straighten up and break that chain of drinking and that chain of cussing and that chain of fighting. Every time I got out on the weekend, I'd get in a fight somewhere and I tried to break that chain of sin, but nothing could break it. But one night, thank God, he who the Son makes free is free indeed. I'm glad one night the good Lamb of God walked in and unshackled me and set my soul free and freed me from the bondage of sin. A lot could be said, not only being born in sin, we're bound to it, but we're blackened by it. It's blackened our lives. We're defiled and dirty, and we cannot change the guilt and the dirt in our lives. Oh, but aren't you glad unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. These are they that have come up out of great tribulation, he said, and washed their robes in the, in the blood of the Lamb, made them white in the blood of the Lamb. I'm glad there is a God tonight that not only can unbind you, but he can unblacken you. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So much in my mind I'd like to say, but I don't have time. So thank God he can take that stain out of your life. Many years ago, probably been close to 40 years ago now, I was preaching a revival in the church, and uh, toward the end of the week, a man got to come, and I won't mention his name, and, and he got to come, and he had just got out of jail a few weeks before that, out of prison a few weeks before that. He'd killed his brother with an axe. He killed his own brother with an axe, and had spent a lot of years in prison and he got out, and he's coming to revival, and he sat on the back seat, Brother David, every night he'd sit on the back seat. And the meeting went into the second week, and in the second week on Tuesday night, I'll never forget as long as I live, here come him down the aisle, I about called his name, but here he come down the aisle, and he's walking like this. So much guilt of sin. A load of sin. Seemed like it took him a month to get to the altar. He was so loaded down. He fell on that altar and began to pray. Others began to pray with him. And thank God he got saved. The next night, I'll never forget it till I die. The next night, he come down that aisle with his head held up. Had a little white zip-up Bible and got on the front seat and sat there and cried. I'm glad, thank God, there's nothing in your life that God can't forgive and God can't change and God God can't wash away, and God can't cleanse you up. I'm glad he can do it, praise God. See, we're born in sin. Being born, we're bound by it, and we're blackened by it, and we're blinded to it. Blinded to sin. Not only are we born in sin, but we are born separated from God separated from the life of God, alienated from the life of God, enmity with God, enemies of God, alienated from the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Alienated from the life of God. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I've got to come to what I want to say in a minute quickly, but alienated, enemies. You tell people today they're an enemy of God and they're about to hate your guts. That's what the Bible teaches we're enemies to God for we're saved. We don't love God. Uh, there ain't no love of God in us. Uh, amen. Before we get saved, uh, we're bound, blackened, uh, burdened, uh, broken, and blinded by the fact that we're born in sin. The nature of our self is sinful, and we can't change it. 
We're born separated, but we're born sentenced. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. He said there in John 3, 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Listen to me tonight. If you're here lost without God, you're already condemned. You're under the condemnation of God tonight. You're under the wrath of God tonight. Amen. And say more about that in a minute. But I'm just saying our nature is wrong and it needs to, it cannot be reformed. It cannot be remade. The old man has to die. And God births a new man back in his place. Trying to decide all I'd like to say tonight, but I would like to say two or three things real quickly, and then I will come to the the message I'm going to give you tonight. We need to be preaching more on the new birth than we ever have. We really do. Four reasons, real quickly. Number one, because of the depravity of our country, sins reach an all time high. It's in the house of God. It's in the house at home. It's in the White House and the schoolhouse. We've raised a, a generation of a reprobate society. That enmity of the human heart has never been so openly manifested as it is today. We need to be telling men and women, we've raised a generation of rebels and reprobates, sinful and slothful, God-haters and sin-lovers, a generation that has spit on our Bible, trample underfoot the blood of Jesus, make fun of what we talk about, and proud of it. We need to tell them they need to be born again. They're sensual self-promoting, pleasure-seeking, religious in nature, but having never been washed from their filthiness, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, they need to be told that they need to be born again. Hurling, I'll come to the truth. Not only the depravity of our country, but we need to be preaching on this new birth because of deception that's in our churches. Never so many deceived people. Never so many deceive people. Paul said, but evil men and seducers, the last days, evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse, deceived, being deceived. Paul said to Titus, unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. Even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, having a, a, been abominable and disobedient to every good work reprobate. I've never seen so many people that profess to be saved. But in works, denies it. I want you to hear this verse of Scripture. I want you to hear this verse of Scripture. You know it well, but I want you to listen at it. Holy Ghost really broke my heart with it in the room before I came over here a while ago. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Know ye not. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived. Be not deceived. Be not deceived. deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers themselves as mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived. That word deceived means to be made to believe as true what is false. Don't be deceived. We're trying to tell ourselves, our people saved, that's living in sin. I wonder what those that fight lordship salvation is going to do with that. I've got on my phone, it's right out there in the truck at one of the big conferences recently. I can play it on the phone. I started to do it and I said not to. This guy stood and he said this. He said to preach lordship salvation. 
to preach the Lordship of Christ. And before you get saved, you have to submit to the Lordship of Christ. He said, that's false doctrine. And he said, this, is, this truth will free you for the rest of your life. This is what he said. I, can let you, I won't let you listen to that. I don't you know who it was, but that's what he said. He said, this truth will free you the rest of your life. He said, preacher, it sounds like you are saying that you can get saved and live any way you want to the rest of your life and still go to heaven. And he hit the pulpit and he said, that's exactly what I'm saying. That is a lie. Be not deceived. Don't be deceived about yourself. Don't be deceived about your family. Don't be deceived about people in your church. People that practice and commit sin, the Bible said, is of the devil. For this cause, God sent Christ into the world to deliver us from sin. Amen. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that doeth not righteousness is not born of God. We must preach it because of the depravity of our country, the deception that's in our churches, the destruction that's coming, and the damnation that's certain. We must preach the new birth. I'm disturbed. I'm not talking about disturbed right now as I stand here all together. I'm disturbed by the course of our country. That's leading people to believe they're saved without a changed life. I want to make eight statements. I preach expositorily 95% of the time. I don't preach well at all, but if I don't preach expositorily, I don't even preach that well. I want to preach more of a uh, subject style in the next few minutes here. And I want to use this statement that Jesus made in John 3. Except, verse 3, except you be born again. And verse 5, except the man be born. I want to make eight statements tonight, and I want to back every one of them up the Bible. Eight statements, and I want every one of them to start with, except you're born again. And draw some conclusions about except you're born again. You say, number one, except you're born again, you cannot escape the wrath of God. Except you're born again, you cannot escape the wrath of God. Psalm 7, 11 said, God judgeth the righteous, and God is angry with the wicked every day. If he turn not, he will rend his sword. He hath bent his bow and made it ready. He hath also prepared for him instruments of death. He ordaineth arrows against the persecutors. God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be, uh, might be saved. Listen to me a minute here. He said, if you don't believe on the Son of God, you're under the wrath of God. Jesus Jesus said, who hath warned you to flee the wrath to come. Amen. 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 Listen to me tonight. Our generation has presented to us a one-sided God. We've told this world that God's a great big genie sitting up in heaven just to wring in his hands and just to die and to save somebody. And, and I'm thankful that's true in its own way. I'm glad he does want to save. But I'm telling you what, friend, he's not going to step down from his throne of holiness uh, and his throne of greatness uh, to bow down. Uh, amen. Every person's born under the wrath of God. If you're unsaved tonight, you're under the wrath of God. Romans 2, listen to these verses. Paul said, And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? O despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. But after thy hardness, after thy hardness, an impenitent heart treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to every man according to his deeds. 
to them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor, immortality, eternal life. But to them that are contentious, do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon... Oh, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also to the Gentile, for there is no respect of persons with God. We are by nature, Ephesians 2, 4, we are by nature the children of wrath. You know what that means? By nature the children of wrath. By nature a stick of stove wood is just good for the fire. By nature it's just good for the fire. By our very nature By our very nature, the very corrupt core of our being. By nature, we're children of wrath. You'll never escape the wrath of God except you're born again. Number two. I want to make a second statement. You will never experience the workings of God. You will never experience the workings of God. Philippians 2, 12, 13 said this, Wherefore, my beloved, as you always obey, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation, fear and trembling. For it is God, listen to me, it is God that worketh in you both to will and to do of his own good pleasure. Thank God. Thank God. When you get saved, God works in you. There's no such thing as a saved person that he does not work in. Let me give you another verse and then come back to that. Hebrews 13, 20 and 21. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. Listen to me a minute. That word working in you to do his will is the word philio. And it's not a passive word. It's an active, aggressive word. And it means literally this. To do his will, it means literally to desire a thing, then to design that thing that you desire, to decree that thing, and then bring it to pass. This is what God's saying. Everybody he saves, he works. He desires something. He designs that, and he decrees that, and thank God, he actively brings that to pass. Amen. 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 Is God doing anything in you? I understand, and I'm not trying to be a smart act, and I hope I don't get cross with anybody. I understand the truth of submission. You've got to submit yourself to the Lord. and I understand that. And I think it's right. We all know that's right. But I want to tell you something. If we're not awful careful, we'll put God working in us, the responsibility upon us. But God didn't say he'd work in you if you'd let him. He didn't say that. He said he desires something. He designs that. And he decrees that. And he brings it to pass. With, or, hey man, I promised myself I'd stay behind here. With or without your consent, there's just some things he's going to do in you. Amen. 
I said amen. There's some things he's going to do in you with or without your consent. For it is God that worketh in you. Hallelujah. Now unto him that's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think according to his power that worketh in us. Brother, amen, I want to get behind here. Somebody can't stand it, but I'll preach all night to do that. I went from when I got saved, I had hair down to here. I had a beard, you couldn't see my face. All you could see is my nose and my mouth. I was so skinny, if I turned sideways and stuck out my tongue, I'd look like a zipper. And uh, I mean, I, and, uh, I, I didn't know nothing. And I'd, I'd been used to going on Sundays down to a little old schoolhouse and, you know, pulling your shirt off and having shorts on and just a bunch of maybe uh, tennis shoes or something and playing ball. And hey, man, I never seen no wrong none of that. But one night, in the floorboard of a car, Jesus Christ come to live inside. I went back to that school a few weeks later, and I was sitting down there and sitting up in the bleachers that Sunday evening, and a girl came by and got kind of following the hair on my arms. I felt like I was totally stark naked. Nobody told me none of that was wrong. I went home and I put some clothes on and I won't even go out in my yard in a t-shirt today. Amen. I'm telling you, friend, God went to working in me. I cut my hair. And I'm not saying that's everything, but I'm just saying, God, thank God. God will do something inside of you. God will work in you if you're saved. But except you'll be born again, you will never experience the workings of God. You'll never experience it. God will never work in you. But if you're saved, you can take me or you or whoever to some place after you got saved that God began to work something inside of you. Don't do that. Do this. Don't talk like that. Don't dress like that. Amen. 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 Somebody give me an amen. amen. Hallelujah. Brother Jones, after Brother Bearden, have you been saved, what'd you say, 67 years? Is that right? Amen. After 67 years, let me ask you this. Did God do it the first five and stop? Brother Jones, did he do it the first 20 and stop? Been 46 years, Brother Maskingale. Amen. You know what I still find? I sat here this morning. I went to Brother Jones. Brother Jones, one of the best friends I got in the whole world. One of the greatest preachers I've ever known. I went to him this morning. I didn't tell him nothing about what I was saying, but he knew, God knew. And I said, Brother Jones, I want you to know that I hope you don't think I'm just trying to sound flattery, but you're preaching this morning. Just stir up a fire down inside me. I went home and I went home. I call the motel home anymore. It's about where I live all the time. And I went back to the motel and I got on my face and I said, God, I want to thank you. That after 46 years, after 46 years, you've not stopped being confident, being confident, being confident of this very thing that he who hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ Jesus. He'll never stop. He'll never stop. He'll never stop, thank God. He'll be, he'll be a working. The day we die, he'll still be a working. But you'll never experience that. You'll never experience that. Preach, I'll never bother you. Number three, I promise you there's a lot more I could say right there, but time over. If you go to the book of Romans, chapter 8, some of those workings 
Romans 8, 11 is motivation. Spirit of him that raised up Christ Jesus from the dead dwell in you. He will also, with that same spirit, quicken your mortal bodies. He'll quicken you somewhere. And I know that both folk think that's talking about the resurrection. I personally don't believe it is. I think he's talking about quickening you right now while you live. Oh, would y'all allow me to preach a minute? He'll quicken you somewhere. Somewhere he'll quicken you. Brother Jones got up here this morning. Brother James got up here this morning. Then began to talk slow and gentle. And then after a while, the Spirit of God began to quicken him. I don't care if you're 10, 50, 75, or 100. Thank God. Every once in a while, the Spirit of God will quicken that mortal body. Amen. He'll touch you with heavenly life and heavenly power. Motivation, mortification, direction. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they're the sons of God. Liberation. You've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you see the spirit of adoption whereby you cry out of a father. Identification and so on. These are works that God does in you when you get saved. Amen. And by the way, he doesn't do it to one and not another. Amen. Number one, you will never escape the wrath of God. Number two, You'll never experience the workings of God. Number three, except you're born again, you will never express worship of God. Listen now. Listen. You'll never express worship of God. I think I'm flipping the page too quick. For we are the circumcision, Paul said in Philippians 3, 3. We are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit with a little s. Amen. We're the circumcision which worship God in the spirit with a little s. And have no confidence in the flesh. You say, well, what's important about that? John 4, 19 said this. The woman said unto him, sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain. And you say that in Jerusalem is a place where all men ought to worship. Jesus said, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship. Father. You worship, you don't know what we know, what we worship. But the hour cometh and now is when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit. Now listen to me closely. And truth. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Right. Listen to me a minute. The hour's coming now is when they that worship God shall worship him in spirit, and it's with a little S. Right. Yeah. Right. I hear people say this. Now listen to me closely. I've heard people say that if you're going to worship God, you have to worship him in the Holy Spirit. That's not what that verse says. Right. It's not what that verse says. Right. It says he that's going to worship God is going to have to worship him in spirit with a little S. That little S is talking about the human spirit. Right. Now, listen to me a minute. God told Adam, the day you eat thereof, you're going to surely die. Well, Adam did eat. Did he die that day? He lived several hundred years, so he didn't die that day. But something died that day. What died that day was his spirit. We're dead in trespasses and sin. Our spirit is dead toward God. Our human spirit's dead. Listen, and until the Holy Spirit, that which is born of the Spirit with a capital S, Jesus said, is Spirit with a little s. Until the Holy Spirit births your human spirit. When the Holy Spirit births your human spirit, the ministry of the Holy Ghost is to call attention to God's Son, Jesus Christ. Now you can sit in the church with a dead human spirit and all the worship in the world going on of worshiping God's Son and you'll never get it. You know why? Your human spirit's dead. But when, listen to me again, when God's Holy Spirit births alive your human spirit, then when the Holy Spirit start, the Holy Spirit starts pointing at God's Son. Amen. You don't know. <laughs> oh, I about said something that y'all got mad about right there. You don't have to have a two thousand dollar quartet singing. 
all the Holy Ghost has got to do is start pointing toward Jesus and lifting up Jesus. And your human spirit says because the Holy Spirit is lifting up the Son of God, your human spirit's alive, and your human spirit says, yes, sir, been there, understand that. Thank God I can worship God because my human spirit has been born of God's Holy Spirit. Listen at me. The acid test of Christianity is not works, it's not church, it's not tithing, it's not praying, it's not reading your Bible. The acid test of Christianity is worship. The acid test of Christianity is can you worship? Now, I don't mean to be ugly here. I preach a dress code, I practice a dress code. I've never seen my wife in a pair of paint shorts, none of that stuff. We practice it, preach it, teach it, and believe it's right. But I've been in meetings where people will shout the house down and strip their throat and down to Beersheba when you preach on stuff outward like that. And then you get to preaching on the Son of God and the cross and the blood of Jesus and what God done, and they'll die dead on a hammer on you. I tell you what stirs up my heart when I hear about God sending his own son from heaven to die for my sin and suffered my wrath and bore my shame and paid my debt and died in my place. Amen. It'll stir up my inner man. It'll help me to worship God. I know what worship's about. It's worshiping the son. Worshiping the son of God. But you'll never, you'll never worship God except you're born again. Lord, I got a long way to go, but I went to church when I was backslid. I know y'all never have done that. I have. I went to church. When I was just praying to God that somebody testify an hour where I wouldn't have to say nothing. Don't look at me like that now. You can act like you're an angel if you want to. I went when I was down, broken, everything else. But somebody got up or somebody took a song. Years I spent and vanity and pride carried not my Lord was crucified knowing not it was for me he died something inside says yes sir buddy yes sir been there understand that thank God worship picks up in the inner man Stirred up by the Spirit of God. You'll never worship God. You'll never worship God. I've got to hurry on, but if you're saved, some of the best worship times you'll ever have is not just down at the church house. It's in that quiet, still place where God starts making love to your soul. And all you can do is just lay there and cry and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Except you're born again, you'll never escape the wrath of God. Except you're born again, you'll never experience the workings of God. Except you're born again, you'll never express worship for God. Number four, listen to me closely. Except you're born again, you'll never explore the Word of God. Listen to 1 Corinthians 2, 11 and on. For what man knoweth the things of man? save the spirit of man which is in him. Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God. Their foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. You look up the meaning of that word discerned, and it means literally to explore, 
to inquire, investigate, interrogate. Let me read Peter Tabb. He said they're spiritually discerned. They're spiritually explored, inquired in, investigated, interrogated. He said you will never be able to understand or explore the Word of God. Come on now, don't die on me. You can read that book to your blue in the face. And you hear it preached month in, month out, week in. I went to the, I'm going to start to say the house again. The motel this evening, I thought about what Brother Massengale said this morning about he sat every day, Sunday, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, and heard somebody tell him about how his help buddies never could hear it. It's spiritually discerned. There's only one teacher of this book. 1 John 2 20, but you have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. 1 John 2, 27, but the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you, and you need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you all things, and is truth, and is no lie, even so I have to taught you, you shall abide in him. You know what that's saying? Now, I don't mean that, don't, 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 don't let me leave something that I'm not saying. He said that you don't need any man to teach you. He said you got an anointing. Where's what he's saying? He don't mean that you, you don't need teachers and preachers and all that. But he's saying this, you got one inside you that knows that book from front to back. I got saved. I'm telling you, my life was wicked. Alcohol and had ruined our family. In 17 years, we buried 15 of my family as a direct result of alcohol. I didn't know nothing about God. If the night I got saved, if somebody had said, Brother Fraser, if somebody had me that Bible and said, find John 3, 16 in 10 minutes and it'd keep you out of hell, I'd have had to went to hell. I didn't know John 3, 16, know nothing about God. <clears throat> I couldn't understand nothing about the Bible. But I got to go into church Never forget, I hadn't been, going, been, been saved just a few weeks. And I went to church, and I heard a, a guy named Charlie Long. Anybody ever know Brother Long? Charles Long was with Rock of Ages prison minister for years. I heard Charles Long get up preaching on how God saved that eunuch over there, and I didn't know what a eunuch was. Something got down inside of me. The more he preached, it began to well up. And I jumped up, and before I know it, I'm hollered, Preach it, buddy! Preach it, buddy! Preach it, buddy! <laughs> After church, my pastor said, buddy's not the right word. It's brother. I didn't know none of that stuff. All I knew, what he was saying, agreed with what's in me. You've got the truth living inside you. If I could put it this way, if you're saved, you've got Jesus Christ. He's the Word. You've got the Word living inside of you. And maybe you hear something you've never heard before. But you look at somebody and said, you know, that's right, ain't it? How do you know it's right? You will never be able to explore the Word of God till you get born again. Amen. Number five, and hurriedly, you can never expect a witness from God. Amen. His spirit beareth witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. Now, I don't want to disconnect nobody here. I want to be friends with everybody, but if I can, but I don't agree with this statement. If you do, I'm sorry, I just don't. Me and you, are, I'll tell you what, I'll let you take me to Ruby Tuesday tomorrow, and I'll let you buy me dinner if you don't agree with me. I had one of these super aggressive soul winning guys that don't believe lordship stuff and don't believe in repentance and all that. And he stood to my face, and this is what he said to me. He said, a man cannot know that he's saved. The only way he can know that he's saved is through the Bible. I don't agree with that. Listen to me closely. If that's true, 
how could I know what I was saved before I didn't even know anything about the Bible? The first witness of you being saved is the witness of the Holy Ghost. His Spirit bears witness with my spirit. I don't need you to testify for me. His Spirit bears witness, but you'll never have that inner. You can pray. <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble here now. I began to talk to that guy that day. And he said, I'll tell you what, you and Billy Mitchell used to go join the church of Christ. That's what he said to me. He said, you and Billy Mitchell used to be going to church of Christ. I've never seen my wife. We've been married 40-something years, 44 this coming November. I've never seen my wife get mad one time, but she got mad that day. And she turned off and walked away. was in a mall, and she turned off. She said, I wouldn't give him the time of day. We know we're saved, 1 John 3, 24, and 1 John 5. We know we're saved. We know we're His because of the Spirit which He's given us. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of His. At my worst day, I'm not saying you can't doubt. I'm not going there, not at all. I know the, I know the devil can attack you sometimes. Thank God, when I get in that book and get in a prayer meeting, let me stop. That's all right, buddy. If I preach a while, I reckon it'd be all right, won't it? I reckon that'd be all right, won't it? I, I don't have much pumpkin for this stuff that every time God comes around, somebody gets the doubt in it, then you try to lead them to assurance. I ain't got much for that. It don't make a lick of sense to me. I'm at the house. Maybe, you know, you're frustrated a little bit. Everything ain't going the way it ought to be and things. And maybe the devil tries to attack you a little bit. You don't feel, quote, unquote, feel saved. <laughs> then you go to church. They get to shouting. And God gets them moving. And everything gets them moving on. And then you start doubting it. <laughs> Does that make any sense to you? It looks to me like if you're going to doubt it, you doubt it at the house but the presence of God would give you assurance that you're saved. People that can't never get it settled. Now, I know it's kind of controversial. People that can't never get it settled. You can't lead nobody to assurance of their salvation. Nobody can do that. I can take that Bible and read to you, and I'm blue in the face, and I can't get you assured. But God can. I watched my sister for years doubt she's saved. Normal, what you'd say, just being you know, a normal service, she's okay. I've got to hurry here. How long have I been preaching? Some of you know right to the minute. And uh, a lot of people had preached to her. Brother Blue had preached to her. And a lot of people preached to her. And uh, I wasn't pastoring the church. She was going to another church. Well, meantime, I was in the church I was at and went to the church where she was. And the pastor knew, he said, the day I walked in, said, God told him he's going to move him, move me in. That's what happened. I ended up taking the church. And uh, I got to watching her. We'd have revival. And every time it broke out, and I mean every time conviction set in, she'd get the doubt and she's saved. I got to think, that doesn't make a lick of sense. Every time God moves on a service, that's when I know I'm saved. A good meeting never makes me doubt I'm saved. This never did, Brother Sexton. Now, I got to think about that. And I thought, there's something wrong with that. There's just something wrong with that. I got to praying about it and prayed about it and prayed about it. And we had Brother Mitchell come in and uh, preach some revival there. And on Tuesday night, son, God swung through that place and she come off over here on the south side, and she got there and went to cry and to pray. A bunch of preachers got around her and said she's doubting, she's saved. I went over to them, and I got to hitting them on the back. Get up, leave her alone. Leave her alone. Leave her alone. She don't need to talk to you. She needs to get a hold of God. Leave her alone. Wednesday night she come back. Thursday night she come back. One of them stood up and said, I ain't coming back. You ain't doing that girl right. I said, let me tell you something. That girl's my flesh and blood sister. Yeah. 
And I know her life better than you ever thought about knowing it. I told you leave her alone. I mean leave her alone. Brother Mitchell standing off on the right over here. You know how Brother Mitchell was. He just come over there and he said, he's telling her right. I got to praying, prayed all day Friday, all night Friday night. Friday night, she'd come back to altar. She'd, pr- she'd prayed and cried, her eyes were swelled shut, just about, and her lip was swelled. And she said, what's the matter with me? I said, you've never repented. I said, you've never repented. You've never seen yourself lost helpless and hopeless without God to throw yourself on the mercy of God. Went on home after service that night, night broke. About six o'clock next morning, my phone rang. It was back in the days before you had that little caller ID stuff. And I picked it up. And the minute I heard her voice, I said, hello. And she said, Buster, I done known something had changed. I could tell it's on her voice. I said, what's, what's wrong, Debbie? And she said, I got saved. I said, what's your problem? She said, exactly what you told me. She said, everybody had tried to lead me to assurance of something I didn't have. As far as I know, that's been about 38 years ago. As far as I know, she's never doubted again. <laughs> I'm about to have a spin. God can do that. God can give you assurance you're saved. Quit. Oh, Lord, help me. Oh, sometimes I say stuff that don't sound right. Quit trying to get it from your preacher. Quit trying to get it from everybody else. Go to the only one that can give you, listen, to be saved, to be sure. (laughs) You'll never expect a witness from God till you get born again. Number six, we've only got three to go. Amen. You're getting a bargain tonight. If I preach this at our church, it'd take me two hours. Number six, just make me closely. You'll never endure the whippings of God except you're born again. Let me repeat that. You'll never endure the whippings of God. Hebrews 12, and you have forgotten the exhortation that speaking to you as unto children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, chastisement of the Lord, nor faint when you're rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chastity, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement, then are ye bastards and not sons. Listen to this. This verse lays down three principles about chastisement. One, sons experience it. All sons. Two, saints endure it. And three, sinners escape it. May I repeat that? All sons of God experience chastisement. All saints of God endure chastisement. And all sinners escape. God don't discipline the devil's children. Somebody help me out there now. God don't discipline the devil's children. I think I'll repeat that. All sons experience chastisement. Saints endure chastisement. And sinners escape chastisement. He said if any man don't receive the chastisement of God, then he's a bastard. One of the reasons I know I'm saved above many is there have been a few times God just beat the devil out of me. I don't understand how people can cuss, lie, cheat, and lay out of church, all the rest of that stuff, you just name it, and swear they're saved, and God let them by. Amen. 
Brother Young, I think I know your daddy well enough to know that he probably got in your britches something you growed up. Amen. That was, <laughs> yeah. God ain't got no children he don't whip. He disciplines every son that he receives. Got a lot of bastards in the church, and I say that humbly. A lot of people have been born of religion, but not wedded to Christ. Have you ever received chastisement? <clears throat> number six, you won't endure the whippings of God. Number seven, quickly, except you're born again, you'll never be eager for the will of God in your life. You'll never be eager for the will of God. Now, I done quoted that thing a while ago about him working with his will in you. Don't you listen to me closely. The will of God means nothing to you. Now, let, me, let, me, let me make plain what I'm saying to say. I'm not talking about personal will, like where you have me to preach, where you have me to teach Sunday school, so and so on. I'm talking about this stuff. I'm talking about the commandments of God. If you love God, you'll keep his commandments. And his commandments is not grievous. What God wants means something to your life when you're saved. I'm about done here. What God wants means something to your life when you're saved. But I'm going to tell you what's the matter. There are people that come in church, many of them, some of them, Come into church, you preach the direct will of God to their life, you preach what God says He wants with their life, they go back out to church and it never influences their mind, their heart, they have no intention of ever stepping up and doing the will of God. They've never been born of God. Right. Now hear me, hear me, I'll, I'll give you the last truth to be done. Hear me well. When you, you, we, we read that verse of Scripture over there that except you be born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Then except you be born again, you cannot uh, enter into the kingdom of God. You ever look up that word kingdom? You ever look up the word kingdom? See the kingdom, enter into the kingdom. You know what the word means? It's the word basilia. Or basilia, however you want to pronounce it. Listen to me, I'm done. Just in a minute. I want more truth after this word. And the word kingdom speaks of a king ruling over a kingdom. You can't have a kingdom without a king. Once you get saved, and you supposedly have entered into the kingdom of God, and the king don't rule over you, uh, just, there's just something wrong with that. We understand, we talk about the kingdom of Satan, we get it. Satan rules over his kingdom. The kingdom of God means basilea. There is a king that rules over the kingdom. If you've ever... I know I've got to hurry. I've got to close up here. You know, I feel no compunction, if I can use that word, to obey Russian law at all. Not at all. You know why? I'm not a part of the Russian kingdom. What they do over there is their business. It has nothing to do with me. But now, you might think you don't have nothing to do with the American role, but you're going down the road in a 55 doing 65, and you see little blue lights come, you'll find out right quick that your heart goes, you'll find out that you are under the authority of that law. And when you get saved and you get in the kingdom of God, you'll find out that the king will rule over you. Lastly, and I'm done. Someone come to the piano and I'm done. I want to repeat my outline to get to the last point and I'm done. Except you're born again, you'll never escape the wrath of God. You'll never experience the workings of God. You'll never express worship for God. You'll never explore the Word of God. You'll never expect the witness of God. You'll never endure the whippings of God. 
You'll never be eager for the will of God. And lastly, listen to me closely. You'll never enjoy the world of God. Yeah. Yeah. I'm asking you a question. Everybody here, and I know most folk here profess to be saved. Not everybody, I don't know. Look at me, everybody. Don't let me cause it's been a little delayed here, a little late. Let me lose you. I ask you a question. Would you enjoy heaven if you made it? Would you enjoy heaven if you got there? Some folk think, now listen to me closely. Listen at me. Some folks think that the resurrection is going to change their inner man. The resurrection won't change your inner man. Regeneration changes your inner man. And all the resurrection is going to do is fix your outer man to agree with what's already went on in the inner man. And some folk think they're going to walk toward hell all their life. Loving the world and the flesh and the devil. And wake up in the resurrection and all of a sudden the change is going to be made. And all of a sudden they're going to love spiritual things. I mean, listen, listen at me. If you don't love it here and now, you will not love it in the resurrection. Do you like preaching and praying and singing and praising and pure living and God's people and the presence of God? What makes you think if you don't like it here? That work starts here. It starts right here. Amen. Amen. Hey, listen to me closely. Hey, some folk wouldn't like heaven if they went there. If your inner man ain't changed, you wouldn't like it if you got there. Amen. It's getting quiet on me out there. You wouldn't like it if you made it. There's an old man there, church. He went there, church. He married a lady there, church. I told her not to marry him. He was a crazy fella. I mean, he had, he had enough money to burn this building. He was rich as he could be. And she, her husband had died, and his wife had died, and she got to going with him, and she married him. A long story. <laughs> I didn't mean to make him mad. I sometimes I speak for I got sense enough to keep my mouth shut. And uh, he come to me one day. He went to Little Old Methodist Church, and I'm done. He come to me, and he said, he said, <laughs> I'll not tell you this. Don't you tell nobody I told this. He said, you think you can go to heaven and chew tobacco? I said, you probably can, but you might have to go to hell to spit. <laughs> Man, he got mad. <laughs> Never did have nothing to do with me after that. <laughs> Would you enjoy heaven if you went there? Amen. I mean, you're going to be stripped of your cigarettes and tobacco and your TV and your porn. Right. And right. Right. Your, right. your worldly music. Right. Right. You'll have to wear clothes in heaven, by the yeah. way. Yeah. Some folk wouldn't enjoy it if they got there. I'm, I'm a serious heart attack. They wouldn't enjoy it if they got there. You're right, preacher. I mean, now here now, you try to preach to them, they say, you're not telling me what to do. I ain't going to do that. I'm asking you a question. If you got to heaven and the heart you're in tonight, would you enjoy what goes on here multiplied by a thousand? Tell it, preacher. Amen. Tell it, preacher. Jesus said, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus who come to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. No man can do the miracles that thou do except God be with him. Right. Jesus says to him, except a man be born again. That's right. Eight Amen. statements tonight. Can you say I've, I'm part of those eight statements? Right. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand by to pray. Brother, Brother Clinton, you come. Have you been born again? Listen at me, young people. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Listen at me, young people. Have you been born again? Do you know you're saved? Do you know you're saved? Our Father, in Jesus' name, I ask you, Lord, to deal with every heart.
make us make our call and election sure. Help us to examine ourselves. Prove ourselves. Know ourselves. God, that we're in the faith, except we be reprobate. Please, God, deny me the searching power of the Holy Ghost. Search every heart. Help people to be honest. Strip them of their righteousness, their deception. Help them to admit the truth. In Jesus' name. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Brother Clint's coming. If you need to come to the altar right now, if you don't know you're saved, why don't you come right down here right now and say, Lord, I want to know I'm saved. I want to be saved. I want to be born again. I don't want to die deceived. I don't want to go to hell. Would you come? Have you want to give invitation, preacher? It's up to you. God picked up. Those ladies are singing. If you need to come, won't you? Some of you young men come pray. Some of you all that you're saved, won't you come pray? Somebody need to get saved tonight. Just mind the Lord if you need to come. We're not going to pull at you. These ladies are singing. Altar's open. People praying for you. I wouldn't leave this building. Would you come get saved tonight? If he's mindful of creation, on this I can depend. I am his child, and I can place all.
they delayed your show anyway, so you ain't going to get to see it tonight. All jokes aside, I can't think of anything more important than somebody getting saved tonight. And I've just heard too many stories of somebody saying, if you'll sing one more verse. And so I think you need to choose you this day who you're going to serve. I couldn't think of a better time for you to get saved than right now and believe on him, who the Lord laid the iniquity of us all upon him. So if you'll come, the Lord will save you and repent and believe on him. You can be saved tonight. Well, let them sing one more verse. This verse is for you. If you need to be saved, why don't you come? All right? One more verse. Praise I have prayed some prayers and felt they never. space of repentance you go home tonight you don't have to get saved here I got saved on a porch somebody's back porch God rescued me Hunter got saved in his car on the way up to the house I mean you can get saved anywhere so you go home tonight and God's dealing with you And God lets you see him. My advice is there's nothing in this world worth losing your soul over. You cast your all upon him. You can trust him. Believe on Jesus. If I can be a help to you, you call me. I don't care what time it is. I'll be a help to you. But I sure hate to see you leave tonight without being saved. Maybe, you know, my dad got saved after Brother Randy preached. And I told you that story. It was so sad. I thought. And I found that. Somebody's got it on video. Somebody was in the back, and I found it the other day. And you can hear my dad screaming out, Oh, God, please save me. It was after the service was already over. So, look, whenever God's dealing with you, be saved. So, all right. Well, we love you. I want to preach after the preacher. You, you can. One second. I want to tell Brother Mullins, thank you for mine of the Lord. Thank you. Thank you for mine of the Lord. Preaching with a burden and love for sinners. Thank you. Somebody's somebody's boy might be in here tonight. They heard the truth. You can be saved. Go ahead, Tyler. Yes, sir. You're fine. Yeah. 
Yes. Amen. Amen. Looking back on it now, I'm very thankful the way that they handled that. Amen. Amen. And, uh, I just wanted to thank the Lord. Really Amen. I agree with that wholeheartedly. Leave people alone. Let God work it out well. Them old timers used to describe it like, how do you know you're you? It's intrinsic. I mean, it's in you. It's like I walk into a room full of people that look and sound just like me. I don't sit there and wonder who I am. Which one's me? I know which one's me. I, I just know that. <laughs> well, let's not get into that. All right, great preaching tonight, Brother Mullins. Thank you so much. And um, I just want to leave you with the Lord, leave you with the message tonight. do want to let you know the schedule. Go, Please go eat with us. The, lady has, the ladies have worked diligently and put a lot into to the uh, meal tonight. So please get something. You can take it to go if you need to go home, I understand. Um, but we want you to eat. Please be careful crossing the road. And you young people are welcome to stay and uh, play volleyball, or whatever y'all want to do. Uh, but let's be mindful of the service in the morning and not come in all wore out. You know, let's make it a decent hour and get some rest get up and pray. We'll meet at 930 in the morning again to pray. And uh, service will be at 10 o'clock. So if you can come, please be with us. We'd love to have you. Um, Brother Young be preaching for sure. Uh, Brother Voles isn't going to make it. He's had some things come up and call me. He's not going to make it. But we've got good men here that will preach. Uh, may even preach Brother Jones again in the morning. The Lord's been using Brother Jones, and um, he just he doesn't know that yet, but he's about to find out, I guess. But so you just be praying. The Lord will give me some wisdom too. All right, we're gonna go home. Thank you for being here. We love you. And uh, again, if you need some help, you get me or one of these preachers. Pull us aside. We'll pray with you and help you all we can. But you need to get to Jesus. Let Jesus help you. Tonight. All right. So we love you. Appreciate you. And uh, I want. Uh, I'll tell you what, let's do. Uh, if you all be all right with this, I usually call on so many of you preachers. Brother Jackson, would you pray for us and dismiss us, please, and pray? I appreciate this family coming. Uh, many of you, uh, there's a family here that's drove nine hours to get here. And I want you to know, I'm just humbled that y'all would even come be with us and worship with us. But, um, and so I want to thank a lot of you. I'd like to call and pray. And brother, if you would, pray for us, pray over the meal, and then you can just make your way on over and go ahead and eat and uh, get going if you need to get home. All right? We love you. God bless you. Preacher, you pray. We'll be dismissed.